Thank you, Jesus. And thank you for praying because I'm here tonight because when my husband saw where the hurricane was going to hit, he said, you're supposed to fly out Wednesday or Thursday. Well, just so you know, tomorrow is Thursday. All the airports are closed. There's no airports flying out of or in. The other thing is there's only a few bridges because the way Florida is that you can get out of Florida. There's no way anybody can get out of Florida that's in the way of the hurricane because they've shut down and closed all bridges. So they're kind of stuck there. So because of that, Marty said, honey, I don't think we're going to make it home in time, so you need to get up there, and I'm going to put you on a flight. This is a miracle, so I've got to share this with you. So I called seven or eight people because I don't know how to get online and get a ticket. So I'm calling this one and that one and this one and this one. And, and anyway, I must have, must have texted or called 15 people, and nobody, absolutely nobody was responding. And he said, honey, I'm 26 miles from the airport where I'm going to fly you out, and you don't have a ticket. And so I don't know what airline to try. So he said, can't you do it yourself? I said, well, honey, I don't know what airlines fly out or in to this airport. He says, well, just do something. So I prayed. <laughs> That's a good one. So I prayed, and the Lord said, call Alaska Airlines. No, call uh, American Air Airlines. Do you know that I got my ticket within two minutes, pulled up to the airport, and the only flight that flies in and out of that airport is the one I called. So what's the odds of that? So God got me here, and Pastor said, well, it means you're here. Because I asked him if I could just stay out there in one of the little trailers until the storm passes. But anyway enough of that. Father, we just come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, almighty God, that you protect each and every person and their animals and their houses and their, but their lives, Lord. So we thank you, almighty God, that those are just things that you protect people in Jesus' name. I pray that everyone hears what the Spirit of the Lord is saying tonight, and if anyone needs a healing, a miracle, and those of you watching on Facebook, on uh, TV, if you need a miracle, or if you're in the Florida area, just know everybody's praying for you. We're not just praying for the people in Florida, Lord. We're praying for all the people in Virginia and Texas and all those that have been devastated. And we give, we don't give you praise about that, but we ask that you protect them in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn with me in your Bibles, because I'm going to do some teaching tonight. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to John the Gospel of John, chapter 5. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5. What? Yes, John, chapter 5. You got it. Okay, so I'm going to start right at the beginning. After there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a gate pole, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches, and a great multitude of sick people, lame, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the movement of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time to the pool, and when he stirred up the water, whoever stepped into it first, when it was stirred in the water, they were made well of whatever disease they had. Now there was a certain man there who had an infirmity for 38 years. It's a long, long time. And Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he'd already been there in that condition a long time. And he went over to him and said, do you want to be made well? Now I'm going to share a little story with you. Do you know that the parents love this little boy? Now he's 38 years now, but he was born crippled. So when the little boy was a year old, the parents would carry this one-year-old baby and sit till the stirring of the water so they could put the baby in the water. Now that's not too hard. Now when the baby's five years old, 
It's a little harder to carry a five-year-old five or six miles because it can't walk, it's crippled, and then sit there for all day or days waiting for the water to move. If you ever had to sit at a doctor's appointment for five or six hours, you know how difficult some of that stuff is. So now, now just think of this. 38 years, this family trusted God and took this baby, which now is 10, 15, 16, 17. When he's 20 years old, he's really, really hard to get to the pool. They probably had to put wheels on a cart and drag him. Now he's 38, and his family is dead. So however, he got somebody to take him to the pool. But when Jesus stood there, he knew that for years, 38 years, this man, which was a boy, is now 38 years old, is still coming. Now, I don't know about you, but I think after about five years, I would have said, forget it. Maybe 10 years you'd say, forget it. But they're not. He's still going. And why would God have Jesus heal only one person? Only one. It said there was hundreds of people at the pool of Bethesda, sick of every disease, waiting. But why did Jesus just go to one? Do you think Jesus doesn't care about all those other sick people? Of course he does. He's Jesus. He has love and compassion. He's God Almighty in the flesh. But why would he just go to one? Because he gets a phone call. My message is called Hearing the Holy Spirit. He gets a phone call. His phone rings. Ding, 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 ding. He had a cell phone. Jesus had a cell phone. Hello? Hi, Holy Spirit. What do you want? Well, first of all, Father God said for you to go to the pool of Bethesda. Did you, did you get there yet? Yes, I'm here now. I'm walking around, all these sick people. And as he's walking around, the Holy Spirit says, now look over to your left. You see that one? Uh-huh. He says, he's been there 38 years. Father God said he's been faithful. His mom and dad have been faithful. His friends have been faithful. They've struggled for 38 years to get this man, grown-up man now, to the pool of Bethesda. If that's not faith, I don't know what faith is. Waiting all day, maybe for days. And he stops and says, and the Holy Spirit says, that's your assignment. So we need to learn, every one of us, what is our assignment? What does God want you to do? What does God want you to minister to? Where does God want you to go? Who does he want you to talk to? What does he want you to say? That's when you are totally led by the Holy Spirit. It said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So if Jesus is doing that by the unction of the Holy Spirit, you and I need to be doing it by the unction of the Holy Spirit. But how do we get so we can be like Jesus? Well, first of all, I'm going to teach you that tonight. But second of all, he gave you the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you speak in tongues and, and build yourself up in your most holy faith, the more you pray in tongues and the more you ask God. Now, listen, if I had a helper, let's say Ray. Ray's been a big helper. He's been coming out to our tent meetings and helping us. And he has been a blessing, especially this year, more than ever, because Marty gets sick and uh, our car got wrecked. So I had to have him drive me to the car rental and drive me here and move there and go there and do that. Anyway, so if you have somebody better than Ray, I know you're probably saying, nobody can be better than me. No, the Holy Spirit is our helper. Is that what it says in the Bible? Don't do anything. I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he is going to be your helper, your teacher, your guide, and he'll also convict you if you do things wrong. Okay. It's how God was anointed. But God's not the only one that was anointed. God says, I want that same anointing on you. I want you to be like Jesus. I want you to be like me. I want you to uh, build up other people. So one of the things I do in ministry, and I've been doing it for 40 years, a little over 40 years, is I'm a cheerleader. And you say, what do you mean by that? I cheer people on. I say, you can do it. I teach and train, and, I, and, I, and my heart is to help as many people get into ministry as possible. 
And sometimes the Holy Spirit will call me, tell me in my spirit, call this pastor, call that pastor. They're going through this. They're going through that. And, and maybe some of them have been ready to commit suicide. But because the Holy Spirit said, go there, talk to that one, they haven't. Because every one of us need to be ministers of the gospel. And it's the same Holy Spirit. Know you not that you are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? You can't get no closer than that. The third person of the Godhead is living inside of you. And when you learn to listen to what the Holy Spirit says, you will walk in miracles and you will talk to people and you won't know why you're talking to this person. You'll be standing at Walmart and all of a sudden you'll read their mail and you'll say, are you going through this, this, and this? And they start crying. Then you have to walk around the counter and hug them for a minute and then they got to go back to work. Because God wants to use each and every one of us. So, so he goes to the guy at the pool of Bethesda, and he says, do you want to be made well? Verse 7, and the sick man answered him, saying, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool, because his mom and dad are gone, everybody's gone, when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps in before me because he can't walk. He has to pull himself. And Jesus said, arise, take up your bed, and walk. So he sees that he doesn't really have all that faith, but he has, he has faith because anybody that's going to go to the same place every day for 38 years and stay there for days and days and days, and I don't know how he got there when he's crippled, it was okay when his mom and dad took him, but it's kind of hard to drag a 38-year-old, and when they're, if he's 38, they must be 40, 50. They don't have the strength now to get him to the pool of Bethesda. So God sees. God sees. God sees the hearts of people that are hurting. You know, I would, uh, I'm just going to say it. If you are uh, free and on Social Security or you... Um, don't have to work and you have money, why don't you go to some of these places, even though you're old, and help move debris and help people get their clothes out of their houses? Because there's a need. There's a need. We have, I have friends that I've tra trained and they've been in my school of ministry and they have been reporting to me we're going here to help where this house got destroyed. We're going here to help this. We're going here to help that. So I've trained them to be servants of the Most High God. But I didn't really train them. They had it already in their heart. Because people that come to my schools have to have two things. They have to have a teachable spirit. If they don't have a teachable spirit, out they go. You cannot teach somebody and train somebody if they do not have a teachable spirit. I had to learn that I have to... Uh, Bite the bullet when people tell me off. And then realize and take it to the Lord and say, God, am I doing something wrong? I do something that's uh, in a book I'm writing right now. I do evaluation. I know that sounds crazy. But every year, a couple of times a year, I sit, especially uh, I take off December. I always take off December. I don't usually preach in December. I do an outreach in December, but I usually don't preach. Maybe, maybe once in a while I do, or one service. And at that time, I sit at the feet of Jesus in my rocking chair in my office. Thank God it's still there, and it's going to stay there in Jesus' name. And I, I sit there and rock and pray, and I have this talk. This will help you. Father, it's been a year. Am I doing better, or am I doing worse? I don't want to every year to go by and have me be the same as I was last year. Every year, we're supposed to go from glory to glory, honor to honor, and it's not works. I know some of you say, well, we don't have to get into works. So no, it's not works. Somebody asked me not too long ago, um, when are you going to retire, Joan? I said, retire from what? They go, from work. <laughs> I said, when you love something, and you love what you do, and you love God, you don't even see it as work. How, how could I say preaching is work? But it's not just preaching. Believe me, there's a lot of work. 
way before, be, way more than sitting at the pulpit. I love it when I give people groceries. Uh, Marty actually got upset with me this last tent meeting because, and Ray doesn't even know this yet. So because it rained and rained and rained and rained and rained at this tent meeting, um, the attendance wasn't as good as it should have been, but we still had a good turnout, and people got saved, healed, and delivered. But Friday night, you were there Friday night, we had to p keep pushing poles up in the air to get the pockets of water out of the tent so that the tent didn't collapse. Saturday at the outreach, it was the same way. Was you there Saturday for the outreach? I think you left. Yeah. So then, because we usually, we're, we think smart, we wait and bring the tent down the day of the outreach because you have manpower and everybody there. But because of the rain and the mud, we didn't have that many people there. And we had already organized two halfway houses and a motorcycle gang not a gang, yeah, motorcycle club, um, to come help put the tent down on Saturday, because we always bring the tent down on Saturday. But because it's raining, you can't bring the tent down, you can't put it away wet, they didn't come. Now, the one mot motorcycle did come and say, we'll do as much as we can, but we can't bring the tent down because it's too wet. So they did what they could, stage, lighting, whatever. When it came time to bring the tent down, they were supposed to show up. Nobody came. This church service got through, and the pastor said, we need people to help Marty and Joe bring the tent down. So three ladies came. Three ladies. And Marty said, I can't use ladies, honey. I said, you're going to have to. We can do. So. I went around just helping Marty bring the tent down, and I, well, not that much. I said, okay, we have to pull out these poles, and you, you can leave the uh, tents of poles on the ends, and, but you gotta pull out these poles, and then we gotta carry them in and stack them over here, and do this. Well, Marty's busy on something else, and so I'm out there pulling on poles, pulling on poles, knocking them down, and, and picking up four or five and carrying them, and he looked at me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm helping bring the tent down. He says, you have two bad shoulders, and you're not supposed to be doing this. I said, these ladies are 60s and 70s, and they're doing it. He says, yeah, but they're, you're a little older than them. I said, I don't care. He says, you go sit in the car. I said, what? He wouldn't let me pick up one more thing. So we had three ladies. Pretty soon, two old men showed up. Pretty soon, an hour later, two more old men showed up. I mean, talking old. Uh, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. But when you're seven, 65 to 70 or 80, you know, it's not like you're young to go help bring down a tent and poles that weigh 600 pounds. So anyway, a tent that usually takes four hours to come down took but 10 hours with a small handful of people. So what I say to people, if you don't have it in your heart to have love and compassion, if you don't have it in your heart to be a minister like Jesus, there's a problem. You all follow what I'm saying. Has any of you watching by TV or here in this room had God speak to you about going and helping in some of these areas? Raise your hand if you have. You have. That's wonderful. So the way, you get, the way you get used of God is this way. You get on your face. I've done this my whole life. You get on your face and say, God, whatever you ask me to do, I will do it. God. I want to just do whatever you tell me to do. I started in ministry by going to my pastor, Doug, and asking him, I'm a baby Christian, Pastor Doug, what, what in this church, Word of Faith, does nobody want to do? He said, nobody wants to clean the toilet bowls. He said, I got rubber gloves and everything, but nobody will clean the toilet bowls. I will. 
And he says, you will? And I says, yes. Now, listen to me very carefully. At that time, I had 400 people working for me, and I had my own janitorial service for my, bil my business. I could have very easily called my, jan told, called my janitor that does my building uh, once a week from one end to the other, and I pay him, and I had plenty of money to pay him, to just go over to Word of Faith and do that building too. But I don't want my janitor, my janitor to do that because I want to serve God. I want to get the credit. I know that sounds crazy. I want to get the credit because the Bible says if you even give somebody a cold drink of water, you receive their reward. And what you do for other people comes around. This is the miracle. Our house is in the direct path of this hurricane. We are neither one there because we're going to save our lives. Everybody else is boarding up their houses, putting sandbags. I have $12,000 worth of books sitting on my living room floor. I have several people with the key to my house that check it. I am shocked at what happened. A they've been in my school. These have all been in my school. They've all been trained by me, by the school I teach. And two of the students that were at my school got the same message the same day. This was two days ago. They said to me, Joan, if we get our houses boarded up and our sandbags, then if we have time, we'll go over to your house and do your house. That's what they said. They called me from my house and said, we both got the same scripture today. And he, they read the scripture to me. Remember when the prophet said to the widow woman, what do you have? I have just a little meal, and me and my son are going to eat it and die. Do you remember that scripture? He says, serve me first, right? They both got that scripture, and they said the Holy Spirit convicted us and said no. You go take care of Jonah and Marty's house, board it up, and get it ready for the hurricane. And then if you have time, do your houses. They were at my house till midnight, boarding up my windows, moving stuff up high, my $12,000 worth of books, they put them on the kitchen counter. You see, when you learn to hear the voice of God, so because Jesus heard the Holy Spirit when the phone rang, go to the pool of Bethesda, and then when he gets there, he gets the rest of the instructions from the Holy Spirit. When you learn to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, Everything you do is going to be successful because it is not you directing your footsteps. It's God directing you. Now turn with me in your Bible to John, John 5, 19. They asked Jesus what, how, he, how he did what he did. And Jesus answered and said, More surely I tell you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he fathers." What the Father does, he does in like manner. Also in verse 30, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of my Father. God's going to tell you how you get that compassion. I told you from the day I started, I cried out to God with every fiber of my being. What can I do? What can I do, Lord? Have me do something, at least I do nothing. I do not want to sit on a pew and just listen to other people preach. I want to be a life changer, a world changer. Use me to help other people. Because if you ask God to put a servant's heart in your heart, and if you ask God to order your footsteps and say, Here am I, Lord. Use me or I'll die. Use me to lead people to Jesus. <coughs> Use me, Lord, to change lives. He will do it. So what I'm saying is start praying to be used of God. He will find something for you to do. And as you're faithful in the small things, cleaning the toilet bowls when you could have hired your own janitor, then I got a raise. After a while, being faithful to clean the toilets with my big rubber gloves, 
Pastor Doug says, could you do the chairs and get them ready for church and vacuum the church? I went, yep. So I went from toilet to church to vacuuming. The next thing I asked my pastor, there was an evangelist coming. I didn't know what an evangelist was. I'm telling you the truth. I was such a baby Christian. He said, we have an evangelist coming. We'd never had one before. So I had to ask him, what's an evangelist? I didn't know what one was. He said, well, it's a guy that's going to come preach at our church. And he, he walks in miracles. Really? Real miracles? And he said, yes. I said, well, how are you promoting it? And he said, well, we've told everybody in the church. No. I said, no to my pastor. No. Make a flyer. Tell me what his name is. Tell me what he does. Tell me a little bit about him. So my pastor wrote it all down on a piece of paper. Now, I have a secretary that works for me, so I go in. I have a printing press. I have all this because of my business. Paper, printer, everything. Color printer. Well, I don't think we had colors. And okay, so anyway, black and white maybe. So anyway, I go to my secretary, Sandy, and I said, Sandy, see this information? Can you make a flyer that evangelist so-and-so is coming with miracles and signs and wonders and the date and the time? Yep. So I made up about five, 600 of them, 1,000 of them. So I went back to my pastor and showed it to him, and I said, Pastor Doug, would you have a problem if I go out and stand on the street corners and hand these out? He says, are you kidding me? Go for it. Then I got smarter after two or three days of that. Wednesday night service came, and I said, Pastor Doug, can I stand up and see if anybody else will help me? I still have five or 600 more, and the service is tomorrow night. So I did, and I got one, one person, Ann Shanaki, and another lady. But see, God will start speaking to you, and before you know it, you're from here to here to here to here. And when you are faithful to be used of God, he'll take you to the next stop and the next place. Jesus, he said he only did what the Father told him to do. When you learn to hear the voice of God and the Holy Spirit, then if he says, make flyers and do this, the next thing I get is, do a Bible study in your house. I said, I don't even know how to read God, but I was obedient. Pretty soon, I met John G. Lake and, and, and Wilford, and the next is history, 45 years ago. So, but even if you never end up in ministry preaching from a pulpit, it's not the pulpit ministry that makes me the happiest. I don't think I'm even a good preacher, to be honest with you. And when I got the tent, I sure didn't think I was a tent preacher. I was scared to death the first night. But when I s preached the first night and saw all these people coming to the altar and getting saved, I went, God, you know what you were doing when you gave us this tent. I guess I can preach in a tent. And Marty encourages me all the time. He goes, honey, you already preach. It's not going to be any different. You just preach like what you preach, but now you're doing it in a tent. And it worked. You step out and do the small things that God tells you to do. And as you do the small things, the smallest little thing is getting some tracks and leaving. I don't have any tracks. I, they're, they're all home. Um, Lord, protect the thousands of tracks that I have sitting at the house, too, and all my books and tapes and everything, and our fifth wheel and our trailers and whatever. Just protect it all, Lord. So you have to learn to be a servant, hear God, and obey God. So turn with me to John 14. John 14, verse 7. Oh, let's just start a little higher. Let's start in verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Stop, Joe. Do you see the opportunity of people getting saved from these hurricanes? Do you, can you see how... Out of the middle of evil and bad things, something good can come. You see, as long as everybody has everything, it's just wonderful. I bet there's people praying that have never prayed before. I would dare say there's people in their houses going, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. People, people that couldn't get out of town, and could, like my friends, they're not leaving. They're going to hunker down. I have several of my friends that are going to hunker down and pray to God that they live through it. But there's a lot of people that are not saved. 
that when disaster comes, or if they got a ticket and they're going to go to jail, or they know they're going to have to serve time, oh God, please save me, they're going to lock me up forever. A lot of them do that, and they pray with their heart, all their heart, and then after everything's all good again, they go back to living in sin. That's wrong. But we have opportunity whenever we see something going on to reach out, share Jesus, help them. You just help them with getting the garbage out of the way and then leading to the Lord. I, we called Samaritan's Purse, Marty and I. Uh, we didn't know that we were going to have a hurricane hit us. So I think God sees our heart. We, uh, we sowed a big, big seed. Marty saw the disaster of that other hurricane, and he said, honey, you need to do this much. Samaritan's Purse was the only one in there first. I don't know if you know that. Samaritan's Purse was in there before FEMA, which never, I don't know if they ever got there, and Red Cross. Americans, uh, Samaritan's Purse, Billy Graham's son, was in there first. So Marty stretches me. He said, honey, give 5000 I said, honey, and so I did. And then I watched. And he said, no, he said, give 10000 And I said, uh-uh, five. So I did five. Then I watched the disaster. And then the Lord said, do what Marty said. So I called again and put it on the credit card. So I called and asked them, I just want to make sure you're saving people because I want to sow into souls. So I don't want you just to be cleaning up this and cutting trees and all this. And this is what they said. So I, I, I'm encouraging you to maybe give that way. They said, every house we help clean up, every family that we work with, before we are through, we lead them all to Christ and leave a Bible for the family. Now, that's a good ministry. And we need to learn to sow into ministries that are doing the work. If you can't do it, sow into it. And we're good ministry. Your pastor is good ministry. They do a lot of work. And they do great stuff. Pastor Mike is one of the fewest pastors I know in America that is helping spin out ministries. You see, he doesn't always have to be the one preaching in the pulpit. He has other people. Some of you get to preach in the pulpit. Some of the people you don't even know get to come here and preach in the pulpit. But because they get started here, right here in this building, they're little by little starting their own ministry because do not despise the day of small beginnings. Unless the Lord builds the house, the labors labor in vain. So let God order your footsteps. And so Jesus is saying here, I am the way, I am the truth. And then it goes down. Philip says, um, he wanted to know who he is. And he said, so verse 8, Philip said, uh, uh, said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said, have I been with you that long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So now you can say, show us the Father. How can you say that? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? For the word's sake, I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the work through the Holy Spirit. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the work's sakes. More surely I say to you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, he shall do in even greater works than these, because I go to my Father. And that whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father be glorified in the Son, that if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me and keep my commandments, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. He will abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you. He will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. Then go up to verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I was present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, things that I say to you. Peace I say to you. 
Let not your heart, wait a minute. I, yeah, peace I say to you. My peace I give you. Not as the world do I give. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. So God's saying, if you will, you know, am I afraid of what's going to happen to my property? No. Do I want my house to be there when I come home? Of course I do. Do I want my cars to work? Of course I do. But that's material stuff. That's it. What did I have him save? I didn't have him save my house or try to save anything. I, I know this is going to sound crazy. I said, Jackie, I have $12,000 worth of books sitting on the living room floor and all my books in my office. So I'm trying to save everything that has to do with ministry. That's what I'm trying to save. So we got them on the countertops and everything. And then they t said in the office they moved everything in higher ground. All the products and ministry tools, my schools that I teach across the United States. I was more concerned about that than a house and a car. Pots and pans and clothes. We had to go buy me some clothes because I traveled up here fast. So we went and bought shoes and pants. I got them on right now. But I had to go get some stuff. God wants us to learn to hear the voice of God. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10. I mean 8, chapter 8. There, verse 1, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit in life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Therefore the law could not do and it was weak through the flesh God did by sending his only son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit for those who live in the flesh whoops for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So we need to come, become spiritual minded. Do you know what it says in Romans chapter 12? In Romans chapter 12, you need to read it. It says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can be the good, acceptable and perfect will of God. I don't know about you. I don't want to be just okay. I don't want to be, it, I want to be in the perfect. It goes through three of them. I want to be in the perfect, perfect will of God, doing what God wants me to do no matter what it costs. And we have to get that in our heart because we're not going to be here much longer, people. Jesus is coming soon. I know people say we've heard that forever. Well, if you read your Bible, you're going to know that we are really close. When you see troops, ar troops surrounding Jerusalem, look up. The war that's going on in Jerusalem and our president, which I, I shouldn't get politi in politics, but if our country turns our back on Jerusalem, which it is, we're in trouble. Because everyone that blesses Israel, God will protect and we need to protect Israel, not send money off to everywhere else. Now, now, maybe everybody needs money, but they are being skimpy with Israel. We cannot be skimpy with Israel because we will feel the effects, which is already happening across America. And I believe it's because we've kind of turned our back. Our government has kind of turned its back on Israel, and that's why you're seeing what's happening all across the country. And I believe that with all my heart. I really do. Because we need to stand with Israel. Support Israel. Because it's going to take the blunt. Because they want to kill all of them. And then they want to kill us. So we know that things are going to get worse. Earthquakes. In fact, did you know right now that the San Andreas Fault, does anybody know what that is? Okay. I used to live in California, and I was so glad because uh, I lived in California my whole life, okay? 
and I, I, I've been through a lot of earthquakes, lots. And you stand, and then you hide under something, and you tell the kids to hide, get under things. But there's nothing you can do, absolutely nothing. So when I moved out of California to o Washington because of my business, I remember calling everybody in California and saying, I don't have to worry about earthquakes anymore. Nothing happens in Washington. That's what I told everybody. I said, safe here, nothing happens, there's no earthquakes, there's no floods. And Mount St. Helens blew up and buried us. So they all called and said, I thought you said there was nothing in Washington. Well, I didn't know a mountain could fly 200 miles and bury us. It's 200 miles from Mount St. Helens to Kennewick and Moses Lake, and we were buried. The daylight became night. I remember my mother being with me. She'd come up to visit because I just moved there. <laughs> and she asked me to go to the Catholic Church with her. She said, Mom, I have to go to Mass. I said, Mom, I, I don't go to the Catholic Church no more. Well, I want you to go. I'm here visiting. Can you at least take me to church? Okay, I'll go with you. So when Mount St. Helens blew, we just happened to be in church, me and my mom. So when it got dark, I shook my mom. And I said, it's the end of the world. Repeat after me. Ask Jesus into your heart. And she was so scared she accepted Jesus. Scared her right into the kingdom. And then I tried telling her about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she said she didn't want nothing to do with it. So one night when I was visiting her in California later, I came in her bedroom and I said, Mom, can we have a talk? And she goes, sure. So I took my Bible with me and I'm going through the whole Bible on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And my mother looks up at me and says, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this now? It's 10 o'clock. Why are you doing this, Joan? I said, because, she said, listen, it's real simple. And she looked at me and said, you don't have to finish this Bible study. And she started speaking in tongues. I said, well, Mom, where did you get that? She said, I went with you to some of those churches where everybody was falling on the ground. And when you led everybody in some prayer, I prayed it, and I didn't get it. And then one night, a week later, I just woke up at night speaking in this Jewish language. You never know how God's going to work. But you have to be willing to be a vessel. You have to be willing to be led by the Holy Spirit. So let's go up to verse 8. So those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have this Holy Spirit, he's not his. And if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Verse 11, but the Spirit himself, who raised Christ from the dead, will also raise, who, who raised Christ from the dead, will also give life to your mortal body through the Holy Spirit. So you might have been dead, walking dead person. Then you get filled with the Holy Ghost and start speaking in tongues, and you build yourself up in your most holy faith, and you start crying out to God and asking God to use you as a vessel to serve other people. Remember what happened in the Bible? The two brothers said, uh, let one be on the left and one be on the right. He said, no, I can't give you those positions. Those, are, those positions have only been given to whoever God wants to do. Then Jesus got a towel and a basin, and he started washing their feet. Peter said, nope, nope, nope. You don't understand what I'm doing. I'm washing your feet, because if I don't wash your feet, you're not part of me. What he's saying is, you want to be part of what Jesus is doing? You really want to be part of what Jesus is doing? I do. I'm waiting for the day. I'm not dying yet. I just want to let you know, and I'm not retiring either. I'm going to slow down a little to do something different that God told me to do. He told me, uh, I can say it. He said, I'm going to use you as a revivalist in the end time harvest of souls. That's what I heard. He says, you're going to get a stronger anointing on you that you won't even recognize you ever again. He said, but in order for you to do that, you've got to slow down and spend more time with me. 
So I'm, take, I'm gonna slow down some because he's preparing me to launch me into something else. I don't understand it all, but I've learned to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. In January of last year, remember I told you I'd take off some time to pray. I was sitting in my office, just praying and meditating on the Lord, and all of a sudden, out of my mouth, my mouth, in the midst of my praying, you will do five tent meetings in the state of Washington. Came right out of my mouth, like full force, speaking out loud. I went, five tent meetings? I don't even know who I could do tent meetings with. I didn't know anyone to do a tent meeting with. I just knew God said it. And I'm telling you, these tent meetings came together by God. I don't know. I, w I could say it this way, accidentally, okay? But I'll give you an example. There was this pastor I used to preach for years ago, like 25 years ago. And there's this guy where I'm staying in Lewiston, Idaho. No, Clarkston, Idaho, uh, Washington, anyway. He had the sign up. I thought he was Catholic, so Marty and I drive by. He had all these pictures, and he had, if you need prayer, come here and all that. We thought he was Catholic. So one day, I was going to the grocery store, and I thought, I'll just stop and see if he's Catholic. So I stopped and started talking to him. And he's not. He's spirit-filled Christian. And I was really impressed with what he's doing. He's got three or four of these all over town now where they can stop for prayer or whatever, prayer stations. And he's there every day, winter, even in the snow, because I was there in January, in the snow. And when I was there with him in January, uh, he goes to the, food, uh, the homeless camps, and he ministers in the homeless camps. So I got all excited. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, it's not your house. You're staying with somebody. And I thought, yeah, I know it's not my house. Ask them if you have permission to use their kitchen. I said, okay. So I asked God, I asked them, can I use your kitchen? I know I'm just a guest at your house, but can I use your kitchen? And then I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to make 500 breakfast burritos and go to the homeless camp and feed them. You know, it took me forever to make these burritos. And Marty told me later, do it easier. He said, if you were to put rice and beans and sausage and eggs in it, it'd been easier. But no, no, I decided it was cheaper to do potatoes. Do you know how many potatoes I cooked? How many potatoes I peeled? How many I had to chop up in small things and put into these things and these things? It took me forever. But if I'd have done what Marty said, if you said rice would have done the same thing, a little rice in there with this egg. I said, wow, I didn't think of that. He goes, well, and we did. I used their house, and the wife says, I can't, I can't roll them because I have something wrong with my hands. And I went, okay. Listen, I have no idea how you're supposed to roll those things because I know you're supposed to tuck the ends in and then roll it. I could never get the ends tucked in, so I wrapped them in foil, and when I got out there and started giving them, I said, don't open it all because it'll all fall out the other end because I don't know how to tuck it. But it didn't matter. They just, the foil kept it in, and they ate it. And we got to pray with them and lead people to the Lord and stuff. I hadn't planned on doing that, but I saw a need, and I prayed and said, Lord, what can I do? This man does it winter, summer, all year long. In the snow, he's out there sitting there in the trailer with a sign that says, and not a little, a little cargo trailer. And he sits out there all bundled up for people to come and get prayer. You never know how God's going to use you. But I heard the Lord say five tent meetings, and then he said five schools. So I had no idea how I'm going to do five schools and five, and five tent meetings. So how does it come about? This guy that's sitting out there doing this that I'm telling you about, I said to him, you know, I preached here 25 years ago, and I've been trying to find pastor, pastor, but I can't remember his name, and I can't remember the name of his church. And I taught Let's Go Fishing for him, and I went by his church, but it's not there no more. It's now a Lutheran church. And the guy in tune with the Holy Spirit said, is his name Brett, Assembly of uh, uh, Abundant Life Foursquare? And I went, yeah, that is. 
He says, that's, that's where you preached 25 years ago. I said, well, I've been trying to find them for 25 years. So I went to church Sunday. And I asked, hey, pastor, you remember me? After the service. And he goes, oh, yeah. Honey, this is that lady that had that let's, let's go fishing book that we had her preach 25 years ago. Tent meeting number one. Told them we were doing tent meetings. I talked to him. He said, yeah. We have another one with him next year. Next one was, you haven't talked to Danny in years. Spokane. All right. He's a Baptist. He's not even spirit-filled. He's not spirit-filled at all. I call Pastor Danny. Hi, Pastor Danny. You think it's time for you to do a tent meeting? Sure. What day you want to do it? And I'm like, tent meeting number two with just a phone call. Tent meeting number three. Then I had four. Then I had five. Then one messed me up. Took me to the cleaners. Anyway, I'm not going into that. And the fourth one, the fifth one that I had said, Joan, we can do a better job if you just give us more time. Let's have you come in January and kick it off, and we'll have the tent meeting in July. It's already scheduled. We've already found the land. So out of just a word of prophecy, five tent meetings, of people that I don't even know came together. So people say, how do you do things? I said, everything I do is by the unction of the Holy Ghost. And if you all learn to get the unction of the Holy Spirit, you'll be amazed how God will use you. God is looking for people to be used, and we don't do it by ourselves. We have a helper. So I'm going to pick on you, and I'm going to pick on you. If I have a great big table here, like one of those long tables, and I need to move it from here over to the door, and you both said that you would help me, and I decided to just start dragging it and dragging it and dragging it, whose fault is it that I'm having a hard time when you both said you would help me? Right? You all get it? So we have a helper that the Lord says, I will give you another helper, and he will help you. But if you don't ask the Holy Spirit to help you find out where you fit, help me, Holy Spirit. Show me, Holy Spirit, who I'm supposed to minister to. Show me, Holy Spirit, if I'm supposed to go help uh, give out groceries. Show me, Holy Spirit, if I'm supposed to go take groceries to somebody. Help me, Holy Spirit, if I'm supposed to go visit at the hospital. If you will ask the Holy Spirit to use you, do you think he's going to not use you? But if you're not praying... And say, oh, God, please use me, God. Please use me. That's what I've prayed my whole life. Use me, God. And I tell God sometimes this. I don't know how to do things right half the time. One time I said something at a church. pastor will never have me back. I don't remember even saying it, but he said I did. But whatever. I, I don't, I'm not a good preacher. I don't think so. Anyway, but it doesn't matter. God will use a donkey. If he can use a donkey, he can use me. If he can use me, he can use you, each and every one of you. But you have to trust the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, this is the truth. You can believe me or not. Very soon, we need all hands on deck. I mean, we need all hands on deck. And I'm so glad you said you're going to have everybody share their testimony because I teach that in my school of ministry. You see, everybody needs to know everybody's testimony because sometimes when you're on the streets talking to somebody as a street preacher, your testimony doesn't fit that person. If they say they have a problem with drinking, I can't fit that because I didn't have ever have a problem with drinking. But I can say, you know, Charles, and I can use Charles testimony and I can use somebody else's test so if I the more testimonies I know I don't have to use mine I can use other people's testimonies to bring in the kingdom to bring in the loss so I'm going to close with this scripture go with me to first oh well let me finish this one verse 14 Romans 8 14 for as many as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God for you did not receive the spirit of bondage against fear but you receive the spirit of adoption where you cry out, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs 
and heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that means a little bit of suffering is coming along the way, that we may glorify with him. So God wants to use each and every one of us. And I want to close with 1 Corinthians, when Paul says, Verse 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ is made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us who believed it are being saved is the power of God. Verse 20. Where are the wise? Where are the scribes? Where are the disputers of this age? Has not God, through their foolishness of the world, God's going to bring all the foolishness of all these people, scientists, and everybody that thinks they know what they're doing. God's going to bring it all to light that the Mormons is deception, the Jehovah Witnesses is deception, New Age is deception, creation, you know, whatever. He's going to bring it all to nothing. We're in the best time in the world to ever live, ever. So it says in chapter 2, Paul says, I preach the word not with enticing words of human his wisdom, but with the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, that your faith should not be in the power of man, but in the power of God. You see, some ministers, and I'm just going to add this, some ministers want everybody to look at them and follow them because they're so-and-so and they're so big. No, no. I don't want people to follow Joan. I want you to follow God. Because when you follow God, God will use you. And then I want to close with this. I have not seen nor ear heard what has been prepared for you that love him. So God's getting ready to do something that we've never seen before. A great move of God like we've never seen before. And he's going to use us for the glory of God. So right now, every eye closed. If you are saying in your heart, Lord, I want to be used to you. I want to be used of you. I, d I don't want to be. I want to evaluate myself. I don't want to be in the same thing next year, the same time. I want you to use me more and more and more and let the fire of God get in me. If that's you and you're saying I want God's fire and I want God to use me by the Holy Spirit and I want to be used of God, then I'm going to pray for you if you want to be prayed for. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, for those of you on Facebook, the most important thing you can do is call on the name of the Lord. Disasters are happening every single day. Things are happening. You don't know when it could happen to you, but you better be ready to meet Jesus. All you have to do is say you're sorry, repent of all your wicked sins, and turn your life around. So if you want to, I'm going to lead them in a prayer, and I want all of you to pray. So this prayer, this prayer, and mean it with all your heart. If you don't mean it, it's not going to count for nothing. But if you mean it in your heart, God's going to change you, rearrange you, and protect you, and make sure you make it all the way to heaven. And that's the Holy Spirit's job to do that. It, he'll convict you if you're getting off course. He's the guarantor of what Jesus put in motion. Right now, everybody here, repeat after me. Father in heaven. I know I've done so, uh, sins. I've done a lot of wrong things. I'm sorry for my life. I'm sorry for what I've done. I didn't mean to hurt you with all my sins. I repent. I ask you, dear Jesus, come into my heart. I do believe that you died on the cross, took my sins on the cross, and forgave me of all my sins. Come into my heart, take control of my life. From this day forward, I will follow you, love you, and serve you. If you prayed that prayer, you can go to Channel of Love Ministries, and we give free Bibles out, and we'll send you a Bible. Channel of Love Ministries, or Joan Pierce, spelled P-E-A-R-C-E. -E. And for the rest of you here, if you're saying, I want to be used more of God, I want to be used by the Holy Spirit, I want that fire of God in me, and you want prayer, or if you're sick, come on up here and stand on these lines.